Good morning, metalheads of the internet, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Metal Meltdown. We've got a special guest. It's Ash Gray, a guitarist from Venom Prison. How are you, good sir? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? How are you doing? Doing absolutely wonderful. I'm a longtime fan of Venom Prison, so I'm super happy to have you on the channel here today. Uh, I'll jump right into it as soon as my phone fucking gives me the questions that I tried to pull up. <laughs> Arab, yeah, <laughs> more tech issues. I don't know if it'll show up in the video, but we just had an interesting conversation about the scary Zoom lady. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Erebus has been out for a few weeks now. Fans are loving it. Critics are loving it. This channel called it the best album of the year so far. How do you respond to all of this? Um, yeah, it's, it's been overwhelming. Like I, I was saying before to someone, I had, a, I had a gut feeling about it. Like, you know, when we came out of the studio, we had like an accommodation not far from where we were recording. And on like the last couple of days, I remember saying to Ben, um, our guitarist, I was like, even if nobody likes this record, it's my favorite record that we've done. And I've, you know, I've got a, a good feeling about this record. Um, and he said the same. He was like, I feel like it's the most honest record we've done to date. And we had like a gut feeling people would enjoy it, but not to this extent by any means. Yeah, like we weren't expecting it. We weren't expecting it to get like the great, great response it had. And mm -hmm. it, it has it has been great. It's been overwhelming. And I'm glad people kind of like it as much as we do as a band as well you know yeah i mean i've i've uh i haven't really spoken to anyone that's even like ah it's mediocre like everyone i speak to really really thoroughly uh enjoys it it's also musically your most diverse album what would you say are your biggest influences in writing and recording erebus um it's so hard to pinpoint because everyone's so different in venom prison like i don't really think there's like two people in the band that are all set on the same things like everybody's got like something different going on or something that they're really into mm -hmm. i think this record was just a way of kind of we always said we wouldn't do the same record twice we've always said that but no matter you know whether it was on animus to samsara to erebus and it, it was really important for us to kind of know that we didn't have to stay in this lane and we could start introducing these things that we always wanted to introduce and these different layers and depths and even just to the point of like me and Ben got really, you know, into synths and electronics. Um, Larissa got into the idea of wanting to do more clean vocals. It was Joe, our drummer's first record with us. I know he did drums on Primeval, but the songs were originally from a demo and EP. So it was his first proper album of like writing and performing as such. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was hard because there was always so much floating around all the time. Like, you know, whilst probably writing Erebus, I wasn't even listening to any metal as such as I try to keep that, you know, at the back of my mind as such. I don't want to be a carbon copy of anything or subconsciously be ripping something off. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like steer away from it. So I think... When I was writing Erebus, I think all I was really listening to was things like synth pop and like placebo and, you know, okay. just, like I wasn't listening to metal or anything like that. I like to kind of stay not away from it as such, but I feel like there's moments that I'm like, oh, this is great. This is great. And then someone will turn around, mainly Ben, and be like, oh, this is sounds like blah, blah, blah. And it's something I would have been listening to so much. And it it, it kind of not not takes away your own you know true ability of writing but i think because you have all these things floating in your mind and things that you like sometimes it's better to just flush it all out and just be like what would it sound like if it was just me like you know no no outside influences or anything like how do i feel this is a good moment the dynamics and yeah it, it's just figuring out what those moments are that are unique to that you know, record as such. So influence wise, anything that would have been in there would have always been there. Like I've always been big fans of like, you know, Maiden and Megadeth and, you know, Ozzy, Sabbath, uh, you know, Priest and all that. So like naturally, like the band was always going to do like twin lead stuff and a lot of like melody going on rather than technicality. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say like, a lot of it just had to do with like more focusing on like songwriting rather than like band or sound influence, like, you know, figuring out what 
a formulated venom prison structure would sound like if we were trying to create songs. So that was the biggest part, to be honest, is thinking about how you were approaching songs and what what emotion and dynamic they were going to experience. So that, that was more the influence, if anything. Like if that moment didn't feel right or that dynamic didn't feel right, then it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be there, you know? Mm-hmm. Would you say then that this is your most personal album? 100%. Yeah, 100%. I, I feel like everybody in the band just completely, you know, put themselves on it. And it's even like when we listen to it as a band, like you can hear like all the bits that is like a certain person, like especially like instrument wise, like if you hear like a guitar section and, and I'm like, yeah, that's Ben. Like he's great at those moments as such. So I think like, yeah, it, it's, Erebus was a hard record to kind of describe because I think it was the only, I say the only record. I think it was one of the record that we just kind of went, right, there's no avenue for this. There's no lane. We kind of write how we feel. And if it fits dynamically as a set of songs rather than just having, you know, I've always kind of said, what's, what's worse than having an album with 10 amazing songs that don't go together or just having like, you know, a consistent album that tells a story start to finish and it doesn't need to all have the same face. It can dynamically shift in and out of each other and be the context and mood of a record rather than just going, this is death metal. It needs to be blast 10 songs. We're mm-hmm. done type thing. So it was all about like feeling and just what that moment was trying to achieve rather than, you know, trying to just be, you know, brutal for the sake of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you also worked on this album in the midst of a global pandemic. How did that change the creation of the album? Um, the only thing it changed, like I'm fortunate enough to have like a home studio at my place and Ben also has one at his place. So writing's never changed in terms of like, I'll write a bunch of stuff on my own, Ben will write a bunch of stuff on his own. And then at some point we'll get together and we'll just Frankenstein all the songs and take the best of everyone's world as such or whatever section fits, you know, a, who's ever song better. So it didn't really change anything in terms of writing. I think the only thing it really did change was the fact that it was more time, it was more reflection and it was just more chance to, you know, kind of normally depend, well, when the, it was closer to the end of, you know, the record of writing it as such, I would just like stand at my back door and have like a smoke or something and just kind of put my headphones in and just like listen to all the demos and kind of like almost vision it and be like, oh, that one sounds like it needs to have this song here. Like that's how this mood's feeling. Those lyrics are kind of here and they will go in here. And it was like almost how it felt like sonically and like lyrically throughout and yeah it's such a it's such a hard thing to really describe but it was more yeah it was just time time is what helped really more than anything and that was the only thing that was different this time okay so just like having more time to like really flesh out the songs and figuring out what you wanted everything to mean and where all the pieces fit all that kind of stuff yeah so like for example like this one is wild when like this is the one that's caught me off guard the most on this record is everybody is talking about golden apples and saying how much they like that song. Mm-hmm. Um, that almost didn't make the record. That oh, literally okay. almost didn't make the record. Like that song, we had like a folder of pre-production of, you know, a Dropbox folder of like 20 songs or something. And that song wasn't in the track listing of the 10. And I remember that I was like, I was out and about on my day. I can't remember what I was doing, but Ben sent me a text message going, go into the Dropbox folder now and listen to this song. And it was one that we had wrote like ages and ages ago, like almost the start of the Erebus writing session. And it was just something about it that just didn't click at the time. And he was like, listen to it now and tell me that isn't the missing piece of this record that it needs right now. And I listened back to it and I was like, that's so like that was so lucky we almost just cut that out completely because we'd never revisited it we always thought we were just over that song and how then i just took it 
and put it in, you know, the track listing of song six and then listen to the whole album again. And it just felt so in place and so right there that I was like, if that time wasn't there, that song wouldn't exist as such. And I think that's kind of like how important it is sometimes to kind of, I know everyone's got deadlines for records and, you know, you can't write a record forever, but certainly just kind of having that moment to like reflect on it and just keep listening to it over and over again, that that's really what helped with this record to kind of like find all these pieces that could kind of all interlink with each other. <clears throat> and Golden Apples was that moment where you had Pain of Oises and it needed something heavy as fuck after Pain of Oises to kind of snap it back into play. And that song that was originally there just wasn't doing that. And then mm. that's kind of when we went to Golden Apples again and was like, that song is the song that snaps it back. So it's interesting to see like what a little bit of time can really, you know, do in the end result, you know? It's for the best. I mean, obviously I can't speak to what the original song on that album might have done, but with pain of uh, Ozice, uh, sorry, how do I even pronounce that? Ozice? Ozies. Ozies? Okay, with pain of Ozies being like um, such a, an emotionally powerful track, especially with those, those keyboards, uh, it's almost got like a, a post-rock, post-metal kind of thing with like melodic death metal. You need something that's a little bit more like rambunctious and, and groovy and, and still smart, but it also still kick your ass. So Golden Apple definitely fits on that album perfectly. Uh, were there any other songs that were like cut from the album or heavily edited? Um, yeah, yeah. They, like a lot of it happened because we write so so much like we honestly write so much to the point where um like for example like gorgon sisters you know that kind of like moshy stompy beat in like the middle of the song um mm -hmm. with the lyrics like once again history repeats um that was like i remember that was like from a, a song that was you know didn't even make it anywhere near the track listing and our bassist like messaged me and he was saying look I really like Gorgon Sisters, but that midsection just isn't doing it for me. He was like, the best midsection I can hear right now is in this song, but like, I don't like the song at all. I just like that midsection. And I was like, okay, it's in the same key. It's, 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 it would work if you wanted to just put it there. And it was a case of just dropping it there, putting it in the middle of that song and going, oh, fuck. That, that works, like that that happened. Mm -hmm. So same again, like that came from a song that had no desire to even be used, but somehow had a riff that became so important to Gorgon Sisters. And it's like, it, it, yeah, it's things like that, like that, like to reflect on something, you don't need the world of time. You just need to be prepared to sit there and just listen over and over and over again until you get to the point where you, you can't perfect and you can't be too much of a perfectionist because you can damage things. But when you get to that point where you go, this is a good song, it's got all the ticks in the box that I need to make me feel like it's done, mm -hmm. move on type thing. And that, that was like going back to Golden Apples, that was that song. It ticked all the boxes. It did everything we wanted to do. But at that moment, it just wasn't grabbing us to put in the track list in. And I think that's why Erebus, like I'm, I was saying, like it, it's all about moments in Erebus because the way the album was kind of created was almost like building it up. And if it had a dynamic that it really required after like Pain of Oises, like sometimes it wouldn't be that song that was just, you know, written and placed there. It would actually be something that kind of sits at home with it so much better and has that true intention of what you're trying to snap back into the record. And yeah, it, it happens a lot. It, it really does happen a lot. Of all the songs on the record, which you, which would you say is the most important and has the most meaning for you? Oh, I'd say Veil of Night. Veil of Night was like a weird, like Veil of Night was a really weird one. Um, okay. I, it was it was a it was a weird one. I remember writing it, and um, it, it was it was a weird time. It was weird. It was so weird. Um, I just remember like writing it and it had this really nice chorus and Ben put this really like nice, like, you know, lead melody over the top. And 
it was a it, in our personal lives it was like i just lost my grandfather and larissa just lost her grandmother and i remember her saying like oh, i want to write a song for her and i was like that's kind of weird because when i was writing this song i kind of felt like you know it was the time of when i lost my grandfather and that was what i wrote at that time and oh, wow i i kind of was like oh wow that that's really that's really crazy to think that you're trying to write lyrics about something that's just happened and i've kind of written this song as i've just had this experience as well so i think we always knew it was going to be one that was going to be like you know uh, a, a challenging one as such because i didn't want to like you know i didn't want to kind of over toast it or anything like that it needed to have that nice balance but just showing that bit more melody to kind of have a you know kind of show that it's a bit more of a compassionate song as such but there's there's many moments like that in Erebus I feel I feel like every song was purposely built to have its moment and its purpose as such so it's kind of hard to pinpoint one I think same again like Pain of Easy is when we're in the studio, like seeing that song go from like a pre-production, you know, coming into like real life as such. That was that was a really surreal experience because we hadn't done anything like that to date. So it was one of these moments mm -hmm. where it was like going in the studio and being like, Scott, we've got this song, right? But you're not going to believe us. <laughs> and you'd be like, you would be like, oh, whoa, that's uh, out there. And I was like, yeah. I was like, but we love it. We love it. Like, so we want it. And he was just like, oh. And then when we, I remember when we finished it, he was like, this is, a, he was, I remember him saying, he was like, this is a fantastic song. And I was like, I'm glad that you have that opinion about it. Cause that's how we felt in the demo stage. Like me and Ben would like, saying, I'm going to say like, I'm going to say absolutely mental now, but you know, there always a cause to it, I guess. Um, <laughs> We would just sit there and play Pain of Oise, the demo, yeah? And we would just put on, like, hour-long videos. Well, not even hour-long, like, infinite-long videos of just shit. And just sit there listening to, like, Pain of Oise and just being like, does it feel like it's got, like, motion to it? And, like, you know, does it, does it feel like it's capturing something? And then I remember even, like, with the music video, our... Uh, video guy Tom he was like what do you want to do and it was like it needs water me and Ben have been sat watching a video of a ship <laughs> in the sea <laughs> for hours and hours like it needs water whatever you do because like whenever I think of pain of oil, all I can visualize is just this fucking ship in the water and it was just like we would sit there and just like hit repeat again and be like <laughs> is this working that's and kind I'm of like, incredible and then this is where it got weirder. Like Ben was just like sat there and like we were listening to the demo over and over and over again. And he was just like getting to like the end of the, you know, towards the later half of the song and was just sat there going like, woo, 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 woo. And I was like, what are you doing? And he was like, I need to get the Digitech out. He was like, I need to go and get <laughs> yeah. the Digitech whammy. <laughs> what is it? What does it look like I'm doing? <laughs> yeah. And then like he literally just like picked up his Digitech whammy, plugged it in and then just started playing that lead line. And I was like, oh my God, the sea feels so much more real now. Like I could, this video is like working, like what's happening? And it it was, it, it was thinking now it was fucking mental. Like how we were just sat there just watching this fucking boat in the rough sea for like four hours. Just yeah, almost like it's a football game. Just like, oh, look at that. That's nuts. It was, it was, <laughs> it was wild. It was so wild. And like, but it made sense when, when I, when I talk about it now, it makes sense because it was just trying to have feeling like it was trying to like, Mm -hmm. be, be the idea of like the soundscape if that makes sense like makes you know sense like it wanted to be that sound design soundscape approach so it, it needed to be able to sit with a rough sea you know like it, mm -hmm. it it's, and then larissa wrote the lyrics of like you know i find peace at the roughest sea and i was like what the fuck is up with everyone and water <laughs> yeah, and it's right. like it's just like did some did you guys go on a booze cruise or something without me what's going on here uh, <laughs> literally it was like the weirdest thing ever because she hadn't heard the song or anything and she just sent me these lyrics and was like hey what do you think of these lyrics i've got and i was like you as well and it was just like what i was like you're mentioning the sea as well i've just watched a four-hour video of the sea <laughs> and it was like 
but it was. I've, it I've was got the I've got the exclusive here, ladies and gentlemen. Venom Prison share a psychic mental connection with one another. <laughs> yeah, like you just like something to do with the sea, but I don't know. But yeah, it was it was to it was to capture that feeling and to get that feeling. We needed to kind of almost mimic what we were trying to feel with it, and yeah, like that's is insane it's as insane as it sounds like yeah that's how that song kind of come to life like it didn't go like oh we need a ballad it was like no this is how i feel right now and it, it worked you know it definitely worked for the best i mean it's it's my favorite song on the album honestly i think it's one of the best songs you guys have ever written and it's it's amazing looking back because when i heard sam sarah the first time i'm like oh hell yeah just gnarly in your face death metal and it's intelligent and like looking back at that record and I'm like, there's, I could not at all picture this band going on to make a song like this. And I mean that in the best way possible. Like it's, it's I, totally unpredictable. I think that's kind of what we were hinting at for a long time with, you know, every time we do any form of press, every time we do like an album campaign or anything, whether it was for Animus or Samsara, we always say that the next record won't be the same. Mm-hmm. is such like we'll always keep roots we know like we know how important that core sound of you know the band is and we know how to kind of in- incorporate and blend it but being able to kind of not stay in a lane and just know that you know we can creatively approach these things is why i think songs like pain of oises doesn't come across as cheesy or corny because we're not writing that song and going hey look guys we can do this trick we're going to make you a whole album of this trick Mm -hmm. because that seems to be what like a lot of bands do when they say like hey we're changing our sound and then they literally like saturate this new idea over everything there's never an introduction to an idea it's like hey this is us now get used to it and people can't because they just can't identify like identify that sound with the band and the way venom prison does it is we just add layers and depth and we just introduce these new ideas we still keep everything you know relevantly like to the core of the sound so i think that's why i think we're able to do that is because we're not oversaturating it in change all the time we're just adding things mm-hmm. again and again and just trying different approaches so yeah it, yeah it's a it's an interesting one uh, your music is often very politically charged and very emotionally brutal and honest. And there are some people who are turned off by this. In fact, I've got one comment from my review reading, yikes, legit sounds like the gayest thing I would never want to listen to. How would you respond to a statement like that? <laughs> oh, what there it, is, there it is there, I guess. <laughs> oh, that is a real good. comment, by the way. I did not make that oh. up. I love it. I love it. It's just so funny. Like, I just, I like the fact that like, it's like they fill this energy in going like, I've got to tell you, I fucking hate this. And I'm just sat there going, that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've said this a million times to people, like the person that's probably saying that probably has a fucking rage against machine tattoo and a black sabbath tattoo and then <laughs> posting on facebook hey keep politics out of metal whilst wearing a black sabbath t-shirt or a like a metallica t-shirt or something. yeah honestly thinking, it's like what, what do you what do you think they were raging against man <laughs> yeah it's like i'm just sat there and i'm just thinking I'm not the idiot in this argument. Like, yeah, it's the, the Black Sabbath one. It's funny you bring that up because I've always said to people, guys, War Pigs was not about bacon. Like, no, no, it's like, certainly like, wasn't. I don't know. I don't know how to explain. Children of the Grave was not about zombies. It was like, these are songs that have very specific things to do with like war and, you know, sp- nu- nuclear war and the consequences of war and growing up in a, a, a land, a town, ravaged by war but sure if all you want to take out of it is you know heavy and spooky great but you know <laughs> it, it just baffles me because like like i said like it is always that like it is always that i, I mean i say yeah always, like 90 percent of the time it's just like i i honestly it's i'm only saying it because i've seen it with my own eyes once where like someone commented like on venom prison being like keep politics out of metal and then i clicked on his profile and his like cover photo was like black sabbath and i was just like 
uh, what? And then he had posted like a Rage Against the Machine song like four weeks prior to that. And I'm just thinking, this is insane. The, like, this the is, irony. Yeah, you know, like it, it doesn't make sense. And like, I think, you know, I've always kind of lived by the thing of like, if you haven't got anything good to say, just don't say anything at all. But mm-hmm. these people just have this like urge to be like, I've had a shit day, like, or, you know, whatever I'm, whoever I am or whatever goes on, but I need to just inflict this all over the world and just say pointless shit. And it's like, it's almost like they think that we're going to lose sleep over it. You know what I mean? Like as if I'm going to lay in bed going, can't believe that guy said that about me today. It's like, yeah. I mean, I, I can definitely speak to that. Like, I, I did a video recently about the whole shit with Chris Barnes being a an old grandpa. This is like, well, he's a legend and you're just a liberal snowflake. And it's like, what what's your goal here? Like, you think I'm going to lie awake at night just like, oh, he called me a snowflake. Oh, no. How am I ever, how am I ever going to get over this? Yeah, like, like <laughs> I don't know. People on the internet are going to do what they're going to do, I, I guess, at the end of the day. And it's like the thing was like, you know, Chris Barnes, like, let's be brutally honest about this. No pun intended. But he completely brought that upon himself. Like he said he was just like, I'm the best thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was. Yeah. He he said that, like, he's disgusted by what death metal has become. He picked a fight with Jamie Josta. He started talking shit about like revocation and Whitechapel because apparently they charge too much for tickets. It's like you brought this on yourself, man. And- yeah, like that's what I mean. Like it, it's not like anyone else was having beef with revocation or anything. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, it's it's <laughs> just you, Barnes. <laughs> yeah, like it was. It's funny you say that because like I remember like we we did like quite a few shows of revocation and they're all super cool guys and. Revocation has just always been good. They've always just been a good, solid band. Mm-hmm. And it's like you see stuff like that, and you're thinking, "Where's this guy come from? And why is he the first person to like just call this out, like out of the blue?" And just mm-hmm. be like, "They charge too much for tickets." It's like, eh, I don't think that's how it works, mate. I don't think they charge too much for tickets. I think the world's changing. Things are getting more expensive you know there's people to cover and people to pay you know what yeah. I mean? like you've got people on the bar working you've got people cleaning working you've got people doing sound working everyone's working like it so what he's trying to say is let's pay two quid for the show and make all these people work for free and yeah, i mean you know, that's more or less what it comes down to yeah just like fuck that yeah, like these people are like working the bar and they're working things and half of them are people who don't even know what band is playing or even fucking want to be there. They're just trying to make money because they need to make a living. And yeah, mm-hmm. they that, it, there's so much that stems from it, you know, like there's so much that just making a big deal of a ticket price is kind of nothing to do with the band ultimately. It is nothing to do with them. It's just who needs to be paid and covered you know and mm-hmm. most of the time it is everyone before the band you know and I, I gotta say too just like as a, a regular concert goer i mean not too regular because toronto's still locked the fuck down but i'm looking at like a concert for like 80 dollars usd and i get cannibal corpse revocation white chapel shadow of intent i don't know that sounds like a decent night on the town to me i'm not really seeing the issue like yeah it's it's not crazy cheap but it was never going to be it's a fucking concert people gotta pay yeah. bills like i don't know i that's think it. that's more than reasonable and then you think about those bands individually on their own as ticket prices you know like you probably pay more than that if you were to see all of them individually you know like on tours and stuff yeah and probably think- like at some club here in toronto would be like 20 bucks a pop plus you know drinks and you're going out for dinner and stuff like that so yeah it adds yeah. up that's what i mean i think it it's it's a tough one and like even you know i'm kind of with people on it that you know it isn't cheap and money's fucking tight as it is for everyone you know what i mean just the way fucking life is at the moment but yeah like it i don't think like pushing it onto bands is a way to kind of fix that problem like especially like you know chris barnes being like oh they're charging it's it's not fixing the problem at the moment Mm -hmm. is it like you know everyone's struggling with it but yeah, same again. Probably jealous, probably bitter. It's just something to throw <laughs> in the woodworks, isn't it? Like, let's be honest. No, like, I no get... one bought Graveyard Classics 4, so he's got to go whip up a shitstorm. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's kind of like one of these things that is like, I, I, you know, I don't like what's happened to death metal. It's like, well, maybe I didn't like what you did to death metal, but I wasn't born and didn't have a choice to fucking say anything. So mm-hmm. <laughs> vice, vice versa, really, isn't it? Like, yeah, we, on- honestly, we didn't choose for it to sound like that all those years ago. I wasn't even born. So, yeah, like what? There's no point saying oh, I hate the way it is now. It's like, well, it's just the way I know it. That's the difference. Yeah, I, and, and it's just like, dude, sounds change, people change, everything changes. And like, if you've got an issue with it, then maybe you should contribute something to the genre other than like ACDC karaoke, because that's all you've been doing as of late. Yeah, I know. I it's, know. Like, it's, like, it's almost like, yeah, it's almost like, yeah, oh, I don't know. I don't know. It, <laughs> That's the, that, that sums it up in general. Chris Brown's, I don't know. Yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> on, a, on, a sl- on a slightly similar note, um, in the wake of that Chris Barnes controversy, this channel and a few others, uh, we're talking about a lot of modern death metal, just kind of like, you know, fuck him. Here's some bands you should check out. And one we've been talking about a lot, myself, Forge Master Metal Reviews, Metal Trenches, is like Venom Prison is a band y'all need to check out. Like, Venom Prison is one of the best things going on in modern death metal. How do you feel about a, a statement like that? And how do you feel right now about the health of modern death metal? Um, it, it, it's a really overwhelming thing to, like, to kind of say. Like, it's incredible. Like, it is incredible. Like, we just set out to kind of write music and write records and tour. Like, we never we never set out to make this band. Like it was never a planted idea. We just kind of came out of our bands. We were previously in and like, we were playing in punk and hardcore bands. All of us were, and we decided to do a metal band and we weren't here to like, you know, do anything other than write music for ourselves. But then so many people just kind of got behind it and like gave us a lot of support with it and stuff. And yeah, like it's cool. And I think we are trying to, kind of be that band to be like you know you don't have to do things the carbon copy way all the time like you can go with your gut and go with something that you think sounds good and it could be something new to the table you know like that that's the thing like if you're not gonna try and do these things it's like think about carcass when they did heart work like they probably sat there thinking oh fuck is anyone gonna like this we've never done something like this before like what are Mm. people thing but they brought something new to the table and everyone loved it and i think that's what i think a lot of modern bands are doing at the moment is just bringing something new to the table whether like you know it's kind of like i I was talking about that sleep token band i know they're like a completely different genre as such but like I, i love what they've just brought to the table with that you know just that record is such like the way it's kind of put together and the way it, the dynamics and the mm-hmm. themes and how like creative it is. And it's just nice to hear something that I'm just not so familiar with all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I have to concede that that's a, a band I'm not crazy into as metal meltdown viewers may remember, but it is objectively pretty cool to see like a bigger band uh, doing something a little different. Like they're not just playing straightforward alt rocker or heavy metal. And they're getting pretty big. Like they've got a strong like online following. I think they were on the cover of Metal Hammer a couple weeks ago or something like that. And that's awesome to see. And as you know, as far as death metal is concerned, I think it's at its most creative and diverse point right now, where like no two bands really look or sound alike. Like Venom Prison doesn't sound like Blood Incantation, and Blood Incantation doesn't sound like Gate Creeper. Everyone's got their own thing going on. And for me, that's really exciting because, like, I was, like, I, when I was growing up, death metal was kind of, like, lower. Like, it was a lot of bands just kind of doing the same thing over and over again. The older bands had kind of fizzled out a bit, and there wasn't much new that was really all that exciting. And that's kind of when metalcore and stuff took over. So it, it's been really cool to see death metal kind of explode in the past couple of years with so much creativity. Yeah, no, it's great. I, it's, it's kind of what I've always like the idea of like Ben and prison always being able to kind of adapt something new every record is because I think that is how we see it. I think we kind of view it the same way as well. Like, you know, what's the point in us trying to repeat something like 
I remember when people would like make the comment of like, oh, how are they going to ever top Samsara? And I remember just sitting there going, I know. <laughs> Yeah. Just, gonna, <laughs> just like I, I, I know y'all ain't ready <laughs> yeah i i know how and it, it's like how do you do that and it's like well we're just not going to fucking write samsara again like that that was kind of the way we looked at it it wasn't so much like oh don't worry i know how to top it it wasn't to do with topping it it was to kind of go oh well we're just not going to write another record like that so mm-hmm. how can you compare how can you compare erebus to samsara like yeah. you know it they're not the same records and i think that's kind of what I like doing with Venom Prison is the fact that you can't really, like, I don't think Animus sounds like Samsara and I, I don't think Samsara certainly doesn't sound like Erebus. And it, I think that's kind of what I like about it is the fact that you can't sit there and compare what we had done before because it's just not the same. And I think that's what keeps that creative flow going with Venom Prison is knowing that we can always do something different with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, with you guys planning so far ahead in advance, are there already plans for some kind of follow-up, maybe an EP, maybe some songs you've been working on? Is there like a general idea on what you might want to do next? Yeah, I I really like the idea of just being creative for a little while longer. Um, it hasn't ever been an opportunity in this band because it would just be, you know, write, tour, record, repeat. So it would... It would always just be like, oh, you've got this album, mate. You feel great about it, right? Get back on the road. And then that creative flair leaves you for a little while and you're just kind of in, you know, robot mode and you've just got the set drilled into you, like yeah. metronome tight. And you lose, you desensitize all that creativeness and it, it leaves you. And to get it back is like just not that easy. And I think that's why we've always constantly just kept writing and writing and writing just so we know that we're not just going to sit there for two years and tour and whatever, and then come back and go, Oh shit, how are we going to write a record? Like I haven't written a song in two years. It's not going to be great. Is it? Mm-hmm. So I think while Cerebus has just come out and we're still quite pumped on, you know, coming out the studio and writing that record and it finally being released, I'd like to do something a bit different and maybe not follow it up instantly with a full length, but I'd like to do something that would support Erebus in a different way than we've ever done before. Like I like the idea of maybe keeping that universe, but playing with ideas inside it, if that makes sense. Okay. So like maybe like alternate versions of some songs, a uh, remix or like maybe some kind of, maybe like some new music videos or something like that. Possibly, possibly it, it could be completely new. It could be reimagined. It could be anything. It's not kind of, solidified at the moment to how we want to do it we're actually doing writing sessions soon just to get back together and talk about it and stuff because we normally talk about stuff before we dive in just so everyone gets the idea of what we're trying to aim for rather than just like writing 10 songs and then sending everyone and then going i hate this and it's like oh shit great (laughs) there we go that's another there's another six months gone but um no i i think i'd like to just kind of find ways to keep it in that Erebus world as such. I think it could be very interesting. It's something we've never done before. And I have very vague, loose ideas what I'd like to do with it, but I just need to kind of hash that out. It's still quite early days, but that's what I would aim to do right now, as well as play the festivals we've got booked and potentially do some shows at the later half of the year. Cause we're, we're going through the same thing here, like tours are being pushed to 2023 and mm-hmm. we've had a tour that was postponed like fucking four or five times and it would just be like, ugh, like are, are you guys, to, uh, are you guys still attached to that Parkway Drive tour at this point? Oh, I don't even know what's happened to that at this point, if I'm honest, like not, I don't know. I don't think we are, if okay. I'm honest, but I don't think anyone who originally was were still apart from like hate breed, maybe. Mm-hmm. but um no i don't really know but it same again like everything keeps getting postponed or moved around and we had a tour a headline tour that was kept getting pushed back and back and we would do pre-production we'd go to practice we'd get all the set ready and you know all the build-up just before the tour and it would be cancelled and i think it got to like the third fourth time of doing that and i remember just like saying to the guys i was like yo i don't know about you guys but 
sack this off and like switch it for writing because how counterproductive is it for us to just go in the practice room all the time, prepare this set, do all the pre-production, get our sound guy, everything, and then just keep cancelling it when that's so much time of writing mm-hmm. that's just been thrown down the drain, you know, for what as such. So I was kind of said to the guys, I was like, keep the festivals in place because they happened last year, maybe they'll happen this year as well, and do something more special at the end of the year. I'd like to do maybe not a tour as such, but a strip of exclusive shows, maybe doing something a bit different live. Like I know with Damination, we kind of brought our friend Joe Quayle to play the cello at the start of the set and in between the set and kind of just thinking of ways to kind of just incorporate that and make it more of a, you know, a, a moment and an event rather than just another set, if, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a, I'm a little over my time. I'm getting my the message from someone that, uh, time to, hurry, <laughs> time to bring it to an end. Uh, oh, but I, I do have one more question for you. Uh, and we're going to end on a slightly lighter note after talking about Chris Barnes and politics and emotions. <laughs> uh, you guys just announced a hot sauce. Literally mm-hmm. yesterday, the announcement went up. Um, whose idea was that? Uh, it was something that like, we always just kind of go, oh, what can we do? And like, I remember someone saying, imagine we had a hot sauce. And then funny enough, we have a friend, Tubby Tom, and he is like a really known hot sauce guy. Like he's worked on a lot of cool shit and he's won a lot of awards and all that. And he just like messaged me being like, Erebus hot sauce question mark. And I just replied. <laughs> and I just you went, replied, yeah, sure, Lamau. <laughs> yeah, I literally just put. I literally just said, yes, full stop. <laughs> and, like, and then he was like, okay, just send me the stuff. He was like, what flavors do you want? So we just talked about flavors and stuff. And then he was like, here's some samples. I'll send them over. And I was like, cool. Like, in fact, in fact, funny you mention it. Oh, shit. Nice. There we go. God, the that looks store. awesome, too, with the artwork across the bottle. Yeah, I love the fact, like, on the side, it just says Erebus, born from chaos, place of darkness between Earth and Hades. Father's death, Erebus. The hot Jesus sauce. Christ. The, 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 the artwork, too, it makes it look like she's going, oh, fuck, it's so hot. <laughs> Do you know what? These, these buffalo like happy, wings, oh. <laughs> that was like a happy mistake. That was a happy mistake. Because, like, when I first, like, looked at it, I was like, oh, that, that's kind of terrifying. Like, Erebus, a hot sauce with the album on. Like, it, you know, the album's out. It'll be, like, kind of like a promo thing. If yeah. Cool. And then I got the bottle, and I was like, oh, wow, it looks like she's having a bad time with the hot sauce. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it, it wouldn't work for any other album art, too. Like, if you put the Sam Sarah cover on there, it would be like, okay, so, like, I guess she's pissed herself because of the hot sauce? That's not a great image. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, or, like, you know, Animus, like, oh, I have a hot sauce and your dick falls off. Yeah. You know, like... <laughs> oh, oh, who knows? Maybe that would work for, like, the ones that are like, oh, no, the hotter the better. I want to I wanna feel this shit in my fucking body, like, long <laughs> after I've eaten the wings and such. That might be our, like, ultra flame one when we ever do one. It'll just be the Animus one, and it'll just be... <laughs> Your dick falls off hot sauce. You do like a the venom prison buffalo wing challenge where it's like you start off, it's like this is this is the golden apple level, and then this is the fucking yeah. <laughs> uh, u- uterine industrialization level, and this is the <laughs> and now we get to technologies of death. <laughs> yeah, whoever if you survive technologies of death, you get like a free vinyl or something like that. <laughs> Oh, don't give me ideas. Don't give yeah, me ideas. That's the special event at the end of the year, a live stream that's, that's buffalo it. wing eating contest. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing. I'm like a sponge. I've got these ideas in my head now going, yeah, we need a hot sauce challenge. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a hold y'all to it if that becomes a thing. Hell, I'll volunteer myself to like MC the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> do you know what? These, these are the moments that normally fruition and actually become a thing like it's normally like these moments <laughs> we joke about when i was like i was like i'd love to do a skateboard and they were like oh yeah who could we do it with and i just spoke to like the shop that i kind of grew up by that's a local skate shop and he's been my friend but well, he sold me my first setup when i was a kid mm-hmm. i walked in there and i was like i want venom prison skateboards and he went 
great let's do a collaboration i was like wow that was so easy i didn't expect that and i just text the guys going <laughs> skateboard collab is coming just like but yeah like, why not right right after the hot sauce the bed sheets the cutlery set <laughs> oh it, it's all been mentioned it's all been mentioned <laughs> Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Ash. Uh, thank you for joining me here on The Metal Meltdown. I'm going to let you go. I imagine you have other people to speak to today. I do, I do. But thank you for having me as well. Thank You're you. very welcome. I'm, I'm hoping that you keep that Buffalo Wing contest thing in mind. Oh, it's never, le <laughs> it's never leaving. It's never <laughs> leaving. Like, you'll see now, you'll go on Instagram tomorrow and be like, damn it, he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this motherfucker gave me an idea. Someone at Century Media is going to be watch, watching this and goes, you know what, Robert? That's a good idea. We're doing it. <laughs> They'll call yeah. you up and be like, yo, guess what we're doing oh. later this year? <laughs> Hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, check out Erebus. If for some reason you haven't already, check out my review or just buy the album. Why not? It's, it's that good. Um, press this button to subscribe. Venom Prison, social media, all that stuff. Anything you want to say to the fine people at home before you, we go? Uh, if you, like you said, if you haven't checked out Erebus, make sure you check it out. You know, keep up to date with the socials. We're always kind of like keeping up to date with any stuff we're doing, which is all at Venom Prison, nice and simple. And yeah, if you have been, you know, spinning the record and backing it and saying like really kind stuff, like, you know, we all really appreciate it. And we are always, you know actively looking and you know everyone's always kind of like posting cool shit people are saying in the whatsapp group all the time so we do notice and we do appreciate it so thank you there you have it ladies and gentlemen subscribe venom prison hell yes y'all have yourself a fantastic fucking day <laughs>